Hi, everyone. My name is Shubhi Panikkar. I'm an engineer working on Chrome. And I'm Philip Walden. I'm an engineer working on the web platform team. Over the last year, we've been part of our metrics team in the web platform, developing a set of new metrics and APIs that are user-centric, in that they capture user-perceived performance. We've developed a framework for thinking about user-perceived performance that we want to share with you today. And Phil and I are really excited to be here sharing these metrics and APIs with you. In our past lives, we've been web developers, and we understand the pains from gaps in real-world measurement. And before Google, I worked on web frameworks for apps like Search, Photos, G+, et cetera. And before working on the web platform team, I worked on Google Analytics. So I know a lot about, and I've seen a lot of the challenges around tracking performance uh, in the browser. So this is the goal of our talk today, to help you answer this question. How fast is my web app? You've certainly asked yourself this. And this may seem like a straightforward question. But the problem is that performance and fast, these are vague words. What does fast mean? In what context? Fast means different things on navigation, or clicking, scrolling, or animations. So what is performance, and what is fast in these contexts? And fast for whom exactly? Right. The truth is, performance is hard. We kind of all know this. And for web developers, it's harder than it should be. That's one of the reasons we're talking about this. You know, there's a lot of tips and tricks that you might have heard. And when not implemented or understood in the right context, they can sometimes make things worse. So in this talk, we don't want to give you more of these tips and tricks. We want to talk about a way to think about performance, a framework, a mental model for understanding performance measurement. And then the hope is that once you understand this model, you have um, a lot more tools at your disposal to solve performance problems yourself in your own app. But before we do that, let's talk about some myths and misconceptions around performance today. So I would say this is probably the most common myth that I hear, some variation of this sentence. I tested my app, and it loads in x point xx seconds. So the reality is that your app's load time is not a single number. It's the collection of all the load times from every individual user. And the only way to fully represent that is with the distribution, like the histogram you see here. Uh, in this chart, the numbers along the x-axis show load times, and the height of the bars on the y-axis show the relative number of users who experience the load in that particular bucket. As you can see, while the largest buckets and the most users were you know, between maybe one and two seconds, there were many, many users who experienced much longer load times. And it's important to not forget about these users. So this um, pattern toward the right is often called the long tail. And unfortunately, it's very common in the real world. And this histogram actually illustrates the difference between measuring performance in two very different contexts. And these contexts are measurement in the lab versus measurement in the real world. And by lab, I mean great tools like DevTools, Lighthouse, web page tests, other continuous integration environments you might have set up. Lab is important. It gives you a sense for how your changes are going to behave in the real world. It helps you catch regressions before they hit your live production site. And they give you deep insight and breakdown so you can track down and fix problems. So lab is super important. It is necessary, but lab is not sufficient. Real world measurement, on the other hand, is messy. Real devices, various network configurations, cache conditions, all of these different conditions for real users are impossible to simulate in the lab. Real user measurement helps you understand what really matters to your users. It helps capture their actual behavior, which may be different from your assumptions or your lab settings. So to really answer the question of how fast is my app, it's important to measure this in the real world. So in our talk today, we will focus on real world measurement. So coming back to this myth for a second, there's another reason why the statement is problematic. The question, when exactly is load? Is an app loaded when the window load event fires? Does that event really actually correspond to when the user thinks the app is loaded? So I'd argue that load is not any one single metric. It's an entire experience. And so it can't be rep sorry, I meant to say it's not one single moment. It's an entire experience. And it can't be represented by just one metric. 
So to better, better understand and illustrate what I mean by that, I want to show you an example. I'm going to play a video of the YouTube web app loading on a simulated slow network. And I want you to pay attention to how the video loads, uh, the app loads, and notice that you know, things are kind of coming in one by one. So can we uh, play the video? OK, so think about how that felt. And now I want to play the second video, and I want you to pay attention to how you feel watching the second video. Think about the experience. Can we play the second video? So that feels different, doesn't it? I bet some of you were not sure if the video was even playing. And that's kind of the point. When you don't give that feedback to the user, it, it makes them feel something. So these two videos, as I'm sure you guessed, load in the exact same amount of time. But the first one kind of seems faster. At least it, it feels nicer because you know, things come out right away. It's like if you went to a restaurant and you sat down at a table, waited for an hour, and then they brought you your drinks, appetizers, entree, dessert, check, and dinner mint all at the same time. Like, that would kind of feel weird. You would wonder why they waited until the very end. So again, you might look at this, and then, then you might think, OK, well, we should optimize for the first initial render, get content there as soon as possible. That's what, that's what this proved, right? And again, that's, sometimes that's true, but that's not always true. Sometimes when you do that, you can make things worse in some cases and cause other problems. So I'm going to play another example, a real life example from Airbnb's mobile website. And so for context, I know personally that the Airbnb engineering team cares deeply about performance and user experience. And they try to make their pages as fast as possible. So one way they do this is use server-side rendering to deliver all the content in the initial request. And it shows because the page loads really fast, even on a slow connection. The problem is that on slower devices that take longer to execute JavaScript, the page is rendered, but it's not usable for a couple of seconds. And you can see that in the video. So can we play the third video? So as you can see, the user here tried to click a few times in the search bar, and then nothing was happening. And it wasn't until you know, maybe the sixth click or so that the, um, the component pane from the top scrolled down. And so to be clear, this video was from a simulated slow device. It doesn't represent the majority of their users. But you know, Airbnb is committed to providing a good experience for all of the users. And they, um, they wanted to fix this, and they care about this. And so they're currently working on a fix of this problem. And I kind of just want to mention on a personal note that I'm I'm really happy and glad that Airbnb was willing to let us show this to you. Um, it kind of, I think it's cool that, that they want other developers to learn from their experience. So can we go back to the slides? All of these examples that I just showed illustrate why you shouldn't measure load with just one single metric. Load is an experience, and you need multiple metrics to even begin to capture it. So this is another commonly held misconception. You only need to care about performance at load time. Now, loading is super important, but it's certainly not everything. And historically, we've all fallen into this trap of narrowly focusing on load. And part of it is just our own developer outreach. Our tools focus pretty much exclusively on loading. The reality is that there's lots of other interactions that happen long after load, all kinds of clicks, taps, swipes, scrolls. Think of all the time you spend on new sites in your email on Twitter or Amazon. Load is a really small fraction of this overall user session. And users associate performance with their entire experience. And unfortunately, the worst experience stick with them the most. So this is a summary of the problems that we've highlighted today so far. Real world metrics are a distribution. They should be seen on a histogram, not as an individual number. Load is an experience. It cannot be captured with a single moment or a single metric. Third, interactivity is a crucial part of load. 
but it's often neglected. And finally, responsiveness is always important to users way beyond load time. So these are the questions that we want you to ask us today. And these are the questions that we hope we can answer for you as part of this talk. User perceived performance is important. What are the metrics that accurately reflect this? How can we measure these metrics on real users? How can we interpret these measurements to understand how well our app is doing? And finally, how to optimize and prevent regressions going forward? So in this segment of the talk, we want to talk about these new metrics and the basic concepts underlying them. So we've all used uh, traditional metrics like DOM content load and window on load to measure load time. The problem is that they don't really correspond to the user's experience of load. They have almost nothing to do with when the user saw pixels on the screen. For example, a CSS style might be hiding the content when DOM content load fires. And even if the content is rendered, Interaction can be blocked. The JavaScript might not be there to hook up a critical handler, for example. And these old metrics completely in, in ignore interaction, even though we know that interaction is super important for modern web apps. So what are the key experiences that matter to users and shape their perception? I think it's helpful to frame these as questions that the, the user might be asking. Is it happening? So did the navigation start successfully? Has the server responded? Is there anything that indicates to the user that it's working? Uh, and then is it useful? Has enough content rendered that the user can actually engage with the page? And once content has rendered, is the content usable? Like, Can they interact with it? Is it blocked? Is something preventing that interaction from happening? And finally, is it delightful? Are the interactions smooth, natural, free of lag or jank? And is the overall experience good? So now let's look at how these questions map to measurable metrics. Here's an illustration of a page's load progress. So the first frame over there is just the blank white screen before the browser has loaded anything. The second frame represents the first paint metric. It's the point at which anything is painted to the screen that the user can see, anything different from what the screen looked like before the response. The second frame shows first contentful paint, the second metric. It's when any of the content is painted. And by content, I mean kind of something in the DOM. It doesn't just have to be text. It could be images or canvas or SVG, something in the DOM that's painted to the screen. In the third, or I should say the fourth frame, you see some more stuff coming in, but it's not quite enough content to be meaningful. And then you get to first meaningful paints in uh, the fifth frame where the user can actually engage with the content. Enough stuff is rendered that the user can, you know, what they came for is here, and they can start consuming it. And then finally, the, the last metric, timed interactive, is when the page is both meaningfully rendered and usable, meaning it's capable of receiving input and responding in a reasonable amount of time. So Phil said that the first meaningful paint is when the page is useful and the user can engage. This is when the primary content of the page has rendered. But what is primary content? Which elements exactly? Now, not all elements on the page are equal. There are some elements that are important. We call them hero elements. And when these hero elements are rendered, you have arrived at the user moment of it is useful, and the user can meaningfully engage with the page. So here are some examples to show you what I'm talking about. These are hero elements for some popular sites. So for YouTube, we think on the YouTube watch page, the hero element is likely the thumbnail of the primary video and the play button. For Twitter, it is likely the notifications count and that first tweet. For the weather app, it's probably the primary weather content, even though there might be tons of other stuff on the page. So when these hero elements have rendered, this corresponds with first meaningful pain and the it is useful user moment. And you might notice that some of these hero elements are content-based, and some of them are more interactive components. Like in YouTube, for example, the hero, hero element is rendered when the thumbnail is loaded and the play button is visible, but it's probably not actually usable until the JavaScript that controls the play button has run and enough of the video has buffered to actually be able to start playing. If, the hero, element, if hero elements are interactive, then not only does rendering them matter, but also, you know, when it's usable, when it's CTI is. However, there are times, as we mentioned, when interactivity can be blocked. 
So to understand why important elements might be blocked and not interactive, think about a time when you were in a long line somewhere. Let's say you know, the grocery checkout or the bank. You're standing in line, and there's one or two cu customers who are confused or they're angry, and they hold up the line, causing a long delay. This is what long tasks do on the browser's main thread. These are tasks that run long. They occupy the main thread for a long time. And they basically block all the other tasks in the queue behind them. And scripts are the most common cause of long tasks, like all the work that scripts do in terms of parsing, comp compilation, evaluating, et cetera. So if you've used DevTools, you're familiar with all the primary type of work, style, layout, paint, script. It turns out all of this happens on the main thread. And it also so happens that most interactions, things like taps, clicks, and even animations, typically also need the main thread. So you can see how this can be a problem. A long script is running, pegging the main thread, and the user is trying to interact. And these interactions are basically waiting in the queue. And this manifests as jank to users, as delays in click, jank in scrolling, or jank in animation. So you might wonder, how long is long? What is long? And so we define long to be 50 milliseconds. Scripts should be broken into small enough chunks so that even if the browser is idle and a user happens to interact, the browser should be able to finish what it's doing and service those inputs, that interaction. And so 50 millisecond chunks will ensure that the rail guidelines for responsiveness is always met. Now, you might have heard a lot about 60 FIPS and 16 milliseconds, and some of you might wonder, why isn't this 16 milliseconds? And so the reason is, yes, if you're animating, then 16 milliseconds is important. And, but animation issues are a small subset of responsiveness issues at large on the web today. And if you know you are animating, then yes, you have to share the 16 milliseconds budget with the browser. Now, long tasks are the cause of most of the responsiveness issues on the web today. And scripts are by far the most common cause of long tasks. So just to recap, this table shows how each of these metrics map to the user question from before. So the question, is it happening, maps to the metrics for first paint, first contentful paint. Is it useful, maps to the first meaningful paint and the hero element timings. Is it usable, maps to time to interactive. And then the last one, is it delightful, maps to what should be just mentioned, long tasks or maybe more accurately, the absence of long tasks. So you might be wondering how metrics like first meaningful pain or time to interactive can work for every app. And you'll be totally right. One size cannot fit all. We have actually spent a lot of time in our metrics team trying to develop these generic standardized metrics that work for every app. And what we've learned is that it's incredibly hard to do that. And that also makes it hard to standardize. That said, there is value in these generic standardized metrics. And so these baseline metrics that work for the majority case, let's say 70 to 80% of apps out there. And we have made such metrics available in our tools. Like you might see them in Lighthouse, DevTools, WebPageTest. And we are working to kind of consolidate these definitions. Down the road, we expect analytics to start surfacing variants of these metrics. The main thing to understand for these out-of-the-box generic metrics is that don't assume that they accurately capture the use, is it useful and is it usable moments for your apps. Try them out. See how well they work for you. And when it comes to real user measurement, we encourage you to supplement these metrics with your own custom user metrics or customize these metrics and make them your own. Make sure that they work really well for your app. And we'll show you specific tips for doing that later. So now that we understand and have these metrics, the question is, how do we get these in JavaScript? That's the most important thing to measure on real users. Historically, we've used, like we said, metrics like DOM content loaded and window load, primarily because they were easy to get in JavaScript. I assume every web developer here knows how to find out when window load happens or when DOM content loaded happens. But these other metrics have traditionally been a lot harder, sometimes impossible, to get in JavaScript. And, and trying sometimes to, to find them can lead to problems. This code sample shows how you would detect long tasks uh, kind of before these new metrics. And this is kind of a hack. So what this code is doing is it's effectively making a request to animation frame loop. It's doing measuring frame after frame after frame. And it's comparing the timestamps from the current frame to the timestamp on the previous frame. 
And if this is longer than 50 milliseconds, then it's considering it to be a long frame. But there's a lot of problems with this method. I mean, it kind of works, but it adds a lot of overhead. It prevents idle blocks. It's not great for battery life. And it doesn't even tell you the source of the problem. You don't know. You, you might know that there was a long frame, and so you can assume there was a long task, but you don't know what script caused that long task. And this isn't just a hypothetical example. This pull request on uh, the AMP project is basically them taking that code out because they realized that it was more trouble than it was worth. Um, you know, the number one rule of performance measurement code is that you shouldn't be making your performance worse, worse by trying to figure out how good the performance is. So these hacks show the need for real APIs built into the browser so the browser can tell us when performance is bad. So perf web performance APIs are the browser solution to real world measurement. These are standardized APIs, so they're available in multiple browsers, not just Chrome. And when available, we definitely recommend that you use these APIs. In practice, though, you will use a combination of these APIs as well as your own JavaScript polyfills. And the reason why polyfills are necessary is because the implementation timeline on browsers will vary. And we are asking you to customize and supplement these metrics. So these are kind of the core building blocks as we see it for web performance. We have high resolution time, which you might be familiar with from your use of performance.now. Performance Observer is an important piece. It replaces the old performance timeline. And it overcomes its limitations, such as no polling, it's a low overhead API, and it avoids race conditions from a shared buffer. So this is kind of what the usage of Performance Observer looks like. And it also happens to be the code that replaces the hack that Phil showed you just a little bit earlier. So performance observer usage is fairly straightforward. You create a performance observer and make a callback. And then you say observe with expressing interest in certain entry types. And as entries of that type become available, the callback is invoked asynchronously. And there are many different entry types. Long tasks is what we show in this example. Uh, but this could just as well have been resource timing or navigation timing or paint timing, which is a new metric we've introduced. This also serves as a really good example of long task usage. You can basically use this code to understand responsiveness issues on your app. The callback is called asynchronously when the main thre thread is observed to be busy for more than 50 milliseconds at a time. And long task is available in Chrome Stable today, so I encourage you to try it out. So this table shows what our recommendation is for how you would track these metrics in your applications. And just to reiterate, having these tracked in your applications is what allows you to measure these metrics on your real users, not just running it in the lab. So first paint and first contentful paint can be measured with Performance Observer with the paint entry type. This is available in Chrome Canary today. Um, Long tasks can be measured with Performance Observer also since Chrome 58. That's Chrome stable right now. For hero elements, it's a little bit trickier because you have to identify what your hero elements are. And you basically have to write some code to figure out when, they're, when that's visible. And I should mention that um, along with this talk, uh, I'm going to be publishing an article on developers.google.com slash web. Very soon it'll be up when this video goes up. That goes into more detail on how to do all of these things. So you don't have to worry about you know, if you're taking notes or whatever. Um, also, I should mention that we're working on a native API to make this easier, where you could annotate, tell the browser what are the hero elements, and then the browser would tell you when they're loaded or when they're, when they're rendered. For first meaningful paints, at this point, um, before we develop a standardized metric, we think that you should use hero element timing as a substitute for first meaningful paint. The first meaningful paint metric is very, like we said, generic. It will, we try to be like one size fits all. Hero elements is for your site, and so it will always be more accurate than first meaningful paint. And finally, TTI, we uh, released the polyfill today, actually. Um, for the TTI polyfill, it's on GitHub, and you can go try it out right now. To give an example of what the usage looks like, you essentially import the module in JavaScript, and then you call the get first consistently interactive method. And that returns a promise, and the promise resolves to the TTI metric value in milliseconds. And then once you have that, you can send it to analytics. 
to get a sense for what the polyfill does, um, you know, I should mention that the the first get first consistently interactive method takes a, an options object, so you configure it for your site. And what you can do is you can pass it a lower bound. The polyfill will assume the lower bound by default is DOM content loaded, but you can give it a better metric for your site. So the way this works is you have the main thread with long tasks and short tasks, and you have the network timeline. And then you have your lower bound, which by default is DOM content loaded. What the polyfill does is it uses these resource timing and long task entries to search forward in time for a quiet window of five seconds, at least five seconds, where there are no long tasks and no more than two network requests. Basically, it's saying once we get to that quiet window, we think that the app is most likely interactive now. And then it considers the moment of interactivity to be where the last long task was. So that's a bit of how this polyfill works. Again, you can pass it a custom lower bound for your site. And one example of what you might want to use is the hero element timing. That would be a great example. You also might want to pass basically the moment all of your event handlers are added, because if your event handlers have not been added yet, the site is probably not interactive yet. So Phil showed you how long tasks can push out your time to interactive. But there's lots of other interactions that we are asking you to care about way beyond learning, like clicks and taps. And uh, delays in these can basically cause pretty bad user experiences. So you probably wanted to know when these important events are delayed. And ideally, there would be a first class platform API that would answer this question. And we actually are working on such an API. But today, you can actually use this code sample to understand the gap. You can basically use the difference of event.timestamp and the current time in your event handler. Now, event.timestamp is our, our best guess of when the event was created. And so this can be the hardware timestamp, or when our best guess is when you know, the tap, you tap the screen. And this difference will tell you how long the event was spending waiting around on the queue for the main thread. Now here, if that difference is more than 100 milliseconds, we send it to analytics. Now we haven't shown this here, but you can also correlate this back to your long task observer. Like you can actually look at what long tasks happened in this time when my event was blocked waiting. And those are likely the culprits. So once you've measured these key metrics and sent them to some analytics service, you want to report on them to see how you're doing. That will allow you to you know, better answer the question, is your app fast? So this is just a you know, just one example of um, uh, a histogram that I threw together from TTI data for an app that I maintain using the polyfill that we just showed you. And the point is not to look at these numbers or compare them, but the main, the main point that I want to make is when you're tracking your performance metrics in your analytics tool, then you can drill down by any dimension that your analytics tool provides. So in this case, we can see the difference between performance on desktop versus mobile. You might also want to consider the difference between um, one country from another country or geographic locations where maybe network availability is not as, as great or network speeds are not as high. It's important to know how those differences manifest uh, across the real, in the real world on real users. In cases where you can't you know, show a, a whole histogram, I recommend using percentile data. So you can show the 50%, the median number. You can also show things like the 75th percentile, the 90th percentile. These numbers give a much better indication of what the distribution was. And they're much better than just averages or just you know, one, one single value. So a really important question is, do performance metrics correlate with business metrics? And again, if you're tracking your business metrics in an analytics tool and your performance metrics in an analytics tool, and this you know, shows the value of tracking this stuff on real users, then you can see and you can answer this question. You know, all the research that we've done at Google suggests that good performance is good for business. But the really important thing is, does, is this true for your users, for your application? So some example questions you might want to know. Do users who have faster interactivity times buy more stuff? Do users who experience more long tasks during the checkout flow drop off at higher rates? Like these are important questions. And once you know the answers to these questions, you can then make the business case for, for investing in performance. I hear a lot of developers saying they want to invest in performance, but you know, somebody at the company won't let them or won't prioritize it. This is how you can make that a priority. And finally, 
we haven't talked about this yet, but you may have been wondering, all of the data we've been showing is for real users who made it to interactivity. And you probably know some users don't make it there. Some users get frustrated with the slow loading experience, and they leave. And so it's important to also know when that happens. Because if it happens 90% of the time, the data that you have will not be very accurate. And so you can't know what the TTI value would have been for one of those users, but you can measure how often this happens. And perhaps more importantly, you can measure how long they stayed before they left. So we've discussed a lot of specific metrics and APIs, and we've shown you code samples. And so now we kind of want to back up a little bit and provide some higher level guidance on how to best leverage these metrics and APIs. So one great thing about everything we've introduced today is that all of these are user-centric metrics and APIs. So by definition, improving these will improve your user's experience. So the first piece of wisdom is drive down first paint and first contentful paint. And all of the traditional wisdom for fast loads applies here. You know, remove those render blocking scripts from head. Identify the minimum set of styles you need and inline them in head. You might have heard of the app shell pattern. That helps improve user perceived perception. perception. Uh, the idea there is like very quickly render the header and any sidebars. Now, first paint and first contentful paint are important, but they are certainly not sufficient. It's really important to improve your overall load time. So it's not just enough to be off to a good start in a race. It's really important to make it past that finish line. And time to interactive is the finish line for loading for interactive apps. So more specifically, minimize the time between first meaningful paint and time to interactive. We saw in the Airbnb demo it was important for users to interact with that search box. Now to shorten your time to interactive, identify what is the primary interaction for your users. Don't make assumptions here. Do they tend to browse, or do they tend to interact with a certain element right away? And then figure out what is the critical JavaScript that's needed to power that interaction and make the JavaScript available right away. One common culprit we've seen are large monolithic JavaScript bundles. So splitting up JS, like code splitting, will take you a long way there here. And you know, the purple pattern kind of fits in here, so, uh, specifically the first, the P and R of purple. Ideally, ship less JavaScript, but if not, at least defer the JavaScript. There's tons of JavaScript that the user is never going to need. All those pages that they're not going to visit, all the features that they're not going to interact with. If there's a widget in the footer that's below the fold that they're unlikely to interact with, defer all of that JavaScript. The third thing we have is reduce long tasks. Cracking down on the long tasks will really help responsiveness on your app overall. However, if you really need to prioritize, at least think about long tasks in the way of those really critical interactions. On load, it's you know, long tasks that are pushing out time to interactive, or long tasks that are in the way of the checkout flow or other important interactions for your app. Scripts are by far the biggest culprits here. So breaking up scripts will certainly help. And it's not just about breaking up scripts on initial load. Scripts that load on single page app navigations, like going from the Facebook home page to the profile page, or clicking around like on the checkout for Amazon or the Compose button in Gmail. All of this JavaScript needs to be broken up so it doesn't cause responsiveness issues. And the final thing we have for you today is holding third parties accountable. Ads and social widgets are known to cause the majority of long tasks. And they can undermine all of your hard work on performance. Like you might have done a ton of work to split out all your code carefully, but then you embed a social plugin or an ad, and they undo all of that work. They get in the way of critical interactions. So to get an idea of this, we're actually doing a partnership with Soasta a major analytics company. And so they're doing a bunch of case studies, and there's some preliminary data that came in. They picked a couple of their sites, their customers who had third-party content. And on the first site, they found that 93% of long tasks were because of ads. On the second site, they found 62% of long tasks were about evenly split between ads and social widgets. Now, long task API actually gives you enough attribution to implicate these third-party iframes. So we encourage you to use the long task API, find out what damage these third parties are doing on your apps. 
And once you've optimized your app, you obviously want to make sure that you don't regress and go back to being slow. You don't want to put a bunch of work into this and then have it all be for nothing if you know, one new release you know, turns everything bad. So it's critical that you have a plan for preventing regression. So this is a, you know, a, a workflow that I promote. You, you start off with writing code. You implement a feature, fix a bug, improve the user experience in some way. And then before you release it, you test in the lab. Uh, I assume lots of people do this. You run it through Lighthouse. You run it through DevTools. Make sure that it's not slower than your previous release. And then once you release it to your users, you also are going to want to validate that it is fast for those users that you release it to. You can't just test in one. You should, these things complement each other. You should be testing both in the lab and in the real world. And so for some automation ideas, you know, the best way to prevent regression is to automate this process. You're probably going to slack on it a little bit if you don't have it built into the release and automated. So Lighthouse runs on CI. Um, and there's actually a talk tomorrow afternoon by Eric Beidelman and Brendan Kinney that kind of goes into how to do this. And I recommend checking that out if you want to learn how to run Lighthouse on CI. If you're using Google Analytics, you can set up custom alerts that you know, trigger when some condition is met. So for example, you could get an alert if suddenly the number of long tasks per user spikes. Maybe a third party you were using changed their JavaScript file, and things got worse, and you, you know, didn't know. And so this is a good way of, of finding out that stuff. So getting back to the original question, how fast is your web app? In this talk, I hope we've given you enough of a framework to think about performance in the big picture in a user-centric way. I also hope we've given you enough specific tools, metrics, and APIs that you need to answer this question for yourself. We know the situation isn't perfect. We know we have more work to do. And Shubi's working on um, this leading efforts here at Google on the, on the standard side. And so she can talk about some of the things that are coming down the road. And so this is our final and last slide. And I just want to say that, yes, we know there are gaps, and there's a number of APIs that we are working on. We'd love to have a first class API for hero element timing. The idea there is that you guys can annotate the elements that matter most for your sites, and then the browser can put those times on the performance timeline. Secondly, we are working on improving long tasks, mostly by improving attribution. We really want to tell you which scripts are causing problems and more detailed breakdowns so you can actually take action right away and fix those issues. Secondly, we want to we wanna really have an API for input latency so you don't have to do, go through all those workarounds that we showed you for event timestamp. Ideally, for your important interactions for your app, you should be able to know like how delayed they were, whether, which long tasks were in the way, and when the next render happens. And then there's other inputs that we haven't even touched on that are in our backlog, things like scrolling and composited animations. And finally, I just want to leave this with saying, you know, we want this, we've said a lot today, but we really want this to be a two-way dialogue. We want to hear from you. We want to hear about your frustrations. Don't be quiet about you know, those gaps in measurement and those, your frustrations with performance. Try out these APIs and polyfills. And please file bugs on the spec repos on GitHub. This is actually the best way to report issues and make feature requests. And if you're working with analytics, like whether it's a different team or a third party, push on your analytics to adopt these new metrics. Ask them for these histograms like Phil showed you. And we are pushing on analytics too on our end. Star the Chromium bugs on performance. This is actually a signal we use for prioritization internally. And we need these signals to make a case for working on measurement. And finally, as Phil said, we have all the links in the article that he will publish shortly. And they will also be linked from the video. Yes, yeah, so thank you. And this is how you can get a hold of us.